Pause the video, give this question a go yourself first. Okay, folks, so the question's talking about key features of a peer-to-peer -peer network. So what do we know about peer-to-peer -peer networks? Well, there's no boss. Every computer in a peer-to-peer -peer network are equal. So that is one thing. This is equal, this is equal, this is equal, this is equal. It's not one computer which is in charge. So all computers are equal in terms of status. How do they work? Well, uh, what's that? Go away, go away, go away. How do they work? Why is that weird? It didn't used to be a square. Why is it gone square? Oh, there you go. Well, these computers share resources. So let's imagine this has got um, a file, but it's a big file. Let's say it's a movie file. And this has also got the same movie, but a second part of that file. What will happen is this person wants to get the movie. So they'll download it from this person and this person. So they'll go to their computer and to their computer. This is different to what we have with client server. With client server, you have a client and you have the server. The server handles requests from the client, like demands. Yo, give me a movie. You go to the server, the server has the whole movie on it and it sends it back. In peer-to-peer, -peer, you can access files and resources like software, applications from everyone. So that's another feature. Each, I'm gonna do this for computer. Each computer provides access to resources or data, if they've got that, because this computer might not have that, some of that data or some of that movie. So it will be useless. And from this, these computers can communicate with each other. So the computers can communicate. So you've got good comms and share resources. Happy days. And the final thing is, normally in a client server network, you would have, as I said, a server. The computers are connected to the server. Well, actually they'll be connected to a router or a switch, which will then give them access to the server. Now you can store security on the router, like a firewall. So let's say you've got a bad guy bad guy tries to get in, zzz, gets to the router, can't get through because of the firewall. But in peer-to-peer, -peer, there's nothing which is actually protecting the computer. So the computers are going to have to have their own security systems built into them. So this is going to have its own security, this will have its own security, this will have its own security, as will this one. So each computer, why do I write that? Let's try that again. Each computer is responsible for own security. So those are the key features of a peer-to-peer -peer network. But we're not done. Describe two negatives, drawbacks of using a peer-to-peer. We've kind of mentioned one already, and that is security. So it's going to have reduced security. Why? Because you've got no central management of security, like having a central firewall. So you're only as secure as your weakest computer. So I'll say that again, you're only secure as let me just make this a bit bigger. Your weakest computer. So let's imagine that this computer here has a really cool antivirus and software firewall. So is this one, so is this one. This dude here didn't bother. So it's quite weak. You access the internet, all of a sudden we get hacked. 
through this computer. Now that we've hacked through this computer, we can directly communicate with this computer, we can directly communicate with that one or this one. So you're only as strong as, as your weakest computer. That's the reality of this. It's quite sucky, but that is a peer-to-peer. -peer. So that would be one point you can mention. What else could we talk about? Well, no centralized backup. If one, or so if, let's change this to if the data on one computer, so if the data on one computer is not backed up, all is lost for. So let's imagine right now that this person again is responsible for the financial accounts. So you've got this like, spreadsheet with everyone's financial data in it. These guys can access it. But let's imagine that this person actually deletes it. That spreadsheet is now lost to everybody. In a client server, you would have a file server. So it's a server which stores files. So you'll have the spreadsheet on here every night, it'll be backed up. So you have multiple copies of that spreadsheet. So that way, if you actually deleted it, you could recover it. But this is not the case with peer-to-peer -peer, because there's no centralized backup system. So that's two negative security. You're only as strong as your weakest uh, PC. And unfortunately, no centralized backup. But what else? Well, let's imagine that I want to put Game Maker, the app Game Maker on every PC. I would have to go around and put it onto this one, then onto this one, and this do Game Maker, then that one, then that one. And let's imagine you've got a thousand PCs. That's going to take me time. And then let's imagine there's an update to Game Maker. I'm then going to have to update this one, then this one, then this one and then this one. Again, it's taking me time. If we had a file server, or a app server even, on a client server network, what I could do is I could install it on here, I can update it on here, I can then push it out, to, that means deploy it to all these others in one go. That means that any updates, I can update it centrally and it distributes it to everybody. So another negative is no central management of files or software. That basically means hard to maintain consistency. You might have software all working at different levels. This could be like version one. This could be like version two. So you've got an issue. Not all the computers might have Game Maker. I might forget to install Game Maker on this one. So that is another negative. Not only is it hard to maintain consistency in software versions, some computers may have different software. I'm gonna have to keep track and I might forget. If I've got a thousand, I'm bound to forget about um, Game Maker for some. Let's have a look at another negative. Goodbye, 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 goodbye. If you've got this dude with a movie on it, and this guy's connecting, and this guy's connecting, and this guy's connecting, and someone else is connecting, guess what? The individual computer, which has got the movie, may respond slow. So imagine loading up a website which takes you 20 minutes because everyone's accessing it. That's going to be annoying. Why is it going to respond slow? That's because it's going to be accessed by other comps. So that's another negative. And the final negative is, in order for us to share our data, 
every computer which is involved. So let's say it's got movie part one, this is movie part two. These guys need to be online. So if this guy wants to download a movie, this person has to be online and this person has to be online. If it, or switched on, we'll use the word switched on. If this person's got a computer that's turned off, guess what? This guy ain't downloading that movie. File servers, put on all the time. So all you have to do is connect. It doesn't matter about them being off because they're not going to be off. So in order to share files, all computers must be switched on so that the files are always available. So this movie is always available. So let me just go through those negatives again very quickly. I'm not going to go through in detail. We can talk about security. You're only as strong as your weakest computer. No central backup management. You've also got no central management of software or files, like deploying this software, like GameMaker. Individual computers may respond slowly if everyone's accessing it. And in order to share files, all computers need to be on with that container files. Really simple. Let's just move this. So those are negatives of peer-to-peer. -peer. Remember, if you have a client server architecture, if you've got a powerful server, it doesn't matter how many people are connecting, you'll be able to cope. So those are different drawbacks. Security, you can talk about that in more detail. I've just given you a quick overview written here. So you'll be talking about you're only as strong as your weakest computer. We can talk about if a computer has a virus, this computer were all connected, it will spread. You can talk about that there's no centralized security system, like having a central firewall, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So each one of these points can be expanded based on what I've just gone through already. So do not just leave it, like do not just put security as an answer. Okay, pause the video, give us a question and go yourself first. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, let's explain how client server model enables employees to access the same files from different computers. Interesting. So client server, just to remind you, you have a server. This server is accessed by different clients. The server is responsible for providing a service. The clients are the dudes who make requests. So, Step one, the employees, computers, when they do comp, are the client. That's a fact. Employee, employee, employee. The shared server shares the files. So the files are on this server it's shared and it shares the files. Three, an employee like Bob can say, yo, give me this file. <clears throat> but it can be on any computer. So Bob might go onto this computer and do it. Or this computer stops working, so it goes onto this computer and requests the same file. So employee can request file from any client computer. And what's beautiful is potentially you could have multiple employees accessing the same file at the same time. Multiple clients, employees can access file at the same time. So this question wasn't asking what's the advantages of client server, it's just saying what is a client server? And how does it allow you to access the same files from different computers? Well, it allows us to do that because of the relationship client to server. Server provides, client as long as it's connected, can request. Okay, finally, Melinda connects her laptop to the internet through her router. What is the purpose of a router 
Well, the whole point of a router is very simple. This is a router. You can have, um, this is a switch or a server or a computer. It receives packets, data packets, because it will have to route those on. The router is not responsible for finding the IP address of a URL. We know that will be using the DNS, not performed by the router. Directs each packet to all devices attached to it? No. It directs each packet to the devices, or let me rephrase that, it directs a packet to where the address is on the packet in the header. So it uses the destination IP. So that means it's only going to go to a certain machine. It's not going to go to every single device that is attached to the router. Stores the IP of um, or the MAC address of all attaches to it. Yes, it'll have like a routing table with that information in it. So the router will have a table, it'll have everyone who's connected to it, so that it knows when data comes in. It looks at the packet, it goes, okay, this is going to 192.1.1.1. Do we have anyone called 192.1.1.1? Yes, we do. It's this building over here. Go to building D. In building D, it'll find the area, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so let's start off with giving an example of an IP version 6, six, six address. So I'm going to do 1, 2, F, 3. I'm going to do 2, 3, 5, 6. I'm going to do A, B, 12. I'm going to do 2, 0, 1, 5. I'm going to do 0, 0, 0, 0. I'm going to do again 0, 0, 0, 0. We don't need to compress it. I'm going to do 1, 2, 3, 4. I'm going to do 5, 1, 2, 3. And now I'm going to describe this. So it's groups of 8. I don't know why I did that. Groups of 8. You could say that each number or each group is 4 hex digits separated by the colons and you can say oh that will get you marks okay Let's see if you can give this question a go an IP address can be static or dynamic describe static and dynamic IP addresses nice and easy so static is really simple and it's used by web servers like Netflix a lot so you've got your server You've got a, uh, well, we can say server or computer. You've got your router. Let's imagine that we have a power cut or this computer gets disconnected from the router. It will be given the same IP address, let's say 192.1.1, as it had before. It won't change. So it's assigned by your ISP to the router to the server or to a device so it stays the same all the time dynamic is slightly different dynamic is where you have a computer so imagine I go into Starbucks I'm in Starbucks I get given an IP address I then leave I then come back again an hour later and I reconnect, but this time I'm given a slightly different IP address. That is dynamic, and that is given to me by the operating system, or should I say the network operating system in Starbucks. So whilst an ISP gives us our static IP address to our server, to our device, when it comes to dynamic, it comes from our network operating system instead. So that would be your answer for static and dynamic. Static is when a computer disconnects and rejoins a network, the address is the same, and you get it from your ISP given to you to a device. For dynamic, 
when the device disconnects from the network and reconnects again, it gets given a slightly different IP address or a different IP address given to you by the network operating system. This question, describe the characteristics of a local area network. Really easy. So it's devices that are connected. So it's a network, so we need to mention connected over small geographical area. That is what it is. Now, you could also mention it uses a dedicated infrastructure. That basically means that if I was to have computer, 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 connected, 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 server, or shall you say router, server, the, this setup, these cables, this router, the server, are all part of my business. You know, just imagine I own a business. They're just for me and my business. They're dedicated just for me and my usage. So it's a dedicated infrastructure. It is just for my usage. Whilst the internet or, or wide area network is more public. You have your routers, you have other networks, but you have no control over these, no control. You've got no control over um, cables, which are outside of your organization. It's not dedicated just for you. Other people will be using it. Local and area network is just for you. Okay, pause the video, give us a go yourself first. Right, so this question is looking at, state whether the network will be a local area network or wide area network for a school within one building. Well, that's easy. We're gonna go with a local area network. Why are we gonna go with a local area network? Well, it's a small geographical area. Makes sense. Because of this, we don't need to, no leasing external buildings or external infrastructure, like external cables. We can just keep it all in-house, so it'll be cheaper. There's no need. Next one, computers, one classroom has three computers, the computers need to be connected to a network, each computer has a network interface card, and there are two different possible devices that could be used to physically connect three computers to the rest of the network. Well, we will need a router, but we'll also need a switch, potentially. You could argue hub as well. Any of those allow for devices to be connected to each other. The school has several laptops. Each laptop has a wireless network interface card. Describe the functions of a network interface card. Well, a network interface card, which is wireless, will have like a little antenna sticking out of it, like that. So it provides an interface to a wireless network. So it's basically saying it allows these laptops to connect using the antenna. It receives, that's really bad, let's do it here. It will receive analog signals. The wireless network, uh, inter network interface card will then turn it from analog to digital converter. So it will turn it to digital signals. It then checks for any incoming transmission. So it checks incoming transmission for the correct MAC or IP address. So it's basically saying, is it for me? Yes or no. It then ignores if that transmission is not for me. So if I'm on my laptop, this is my network interface card. I've got a MAC address. I'm going to do M for MAC and I for IP address. The data comes in. It's got a header with an IP address, but the IP address does not match mine. 
my network interface card is not going to be bothered about it, so it just ignores it. It also, when I do get the data coming in and it is for me, it can encrypt if I'm sending data out. So let's do it now again this way, sorry my bad. So if we're sending a data out, it can encrypt or it can decrypt if data is coming in. When we are sending data, so this is my laptop and I want to send it to somebody else, the network interface card will also take the digital, so digital in my computer, and then convert it into analog. So it reverses the process. So when data comes in, it's analog to digital. Going out, digital to analog in itself. So there's a lot of little jobs the network interface card does. So it provides an interface to wireless networks using the antenna. It's um, there to receive analog waves, which then combines and converts them to a digital signal or digital waves. It checks for incoming transmissions against my MAC address or IP address. It ignores the transmission if it's not linked to me. It encrypts or decrypts data, depending if I'm sending or receiving. It also takes my digital data or signal and it converts it to analog when I'm sending data out. And that is the functions of the wireless network interface card. Pause the video, give these questions to get yourself first and then I'm gonna do a solution with you. Okay, hoping that you've done that. So, let's rock and roll. First thing, the local area network has a range of different topologies. One sub-network connects four computers and one server set up as a star topology. Cool. So we're using a star to describe how packets are transmitted between two of the computers in this uh, subnetwork. So, so in this situation, we're not dealing with a switch or a hub. We're dealing with a server, which is like connecting these computers together, which is really odd, but it can happen. So what happens is the following. This computer wants to send data to this computer over here. So we're going to call this A, we're going to call this B. A sends a data packet. This packet has the address of computer B. The packet then goes to the server. The server will then look at the packet um, and will well, read the address on the packet, should I say, and will then transmit it to the recipient. The packet will only go to recipient and no one else. So what do we learn from this? We know that, as I just said, packet has address of R for recipient. That'll get you one mark. If you mention the sender, sends or transmits, P for packet, to server, that'll get you another mark. If you mentioned server reads address of packet that's another mark if you mentioned server i'm going to do s for server transmits packet directly to recipient that's another mark and only two recipient. That's another mark. So these are your choices to get three marks for that. Identify three other hardware components that might be used to set up a LAN. There's loads we can talk about. Modem, router, bridge, switch, hub, wireless access point, network interface card or wireless network interface card and don't forget a repeater got to boost those signals so any of those are perfect for a local area network describe how csma slash cd manages collisions during data transmission okay so what is meant by carrier sense multiple access slash collision detection? Well, it is used basically in old school Ethernet technology. So whenever we talk about Ethernet, 
we can mention collision detection. How does it work? Well, you've got your workstations, which are these computers, workstations, WT. And they're constantly listening. Constantly listening, like you guys are doing now, but you don't stop listening. If there's no data being sent along these channels, a computer, let me just scroll down, the workstation, I'm going to do WT, I don't know why I do T for workstation, whatever. The workstation can send data. So it's listening, it's listening, it's listening, nothing's being sent, so this dude decides to send the data. Now, what was to happen if they're both listening, this computer and this computer, and they both send at the same time, they could lead to be a collision. So if another workstation, don't ask me why it's WT, sends data at the same time, it can cause a collision. Which is where the data sort of crashes. What happens next if there's a collision? Well, it's not the end of the world. What will happen is this workstation and this workstation will wait a random amount of time. It could be two seconds here, it could be five seconds here. And it'll send again. So this dude will send after two seconds. So it'll go one, two, and then send. This dude will count one, two, three, four, five, and then send. That way, you're not going to get a collision anymore. We've acknowledged there's a collision, but we've added this random wait time. So I'm going to put workstation, random wait time. We then resend. If there was a collision again, so let's imagine we waited two seconds and four seconds and there's another collision. What we're gonna do is we're gonna increase the random, oh, we our space, the random wait time. Okay, pause the video and give all these questions a go. So you've got that. Let me zoom in slightly. Oh, let me move this up here so you can see it. That's a great idea. Give all these questions a go. Pause the video. Okay, I'm going to deal with this first question to begin with. We need to draw a bus network. So a bus network normally has, at one end, a terminator not the robot. So I'll put Terminator. I'm going to draw one cable which just goes like this. And another Terminator at the other end. And that is your bus network. So based on this being a bus network, we need to say whether or not these are true or false. Computer C uses the IP address of computer A to indicate that a packet is for computer A. If computer C is sending it to computer A, that is true. Computer C will still say, yo, computer A, I need your IP address, I'm gonna send it to you. So C gets the IP address, goes to computer A. However, on that journey, Computer B can also read this packet. That is true. If it goes by it, it can read it. Three, the file server routes a packet. False. File servers don't route unless they're specifically made to do that. If that's the case, what would happen is A, so C would have to send it to the file server. So imagine this, it has to go to the file server the file server will be like, oh, this is going to A. So it sends it, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> why would it do that? It's stupid. In this situation, that's the same do that.
Computer A starts transmitting a packet to computer C. At the same time, the file server starts sending a packet to computer D. So, we've got computer A transmits a computer to computer C. File server sends a packet to computer D. But here's an issue. What's actually going to happen is the following. So let's just tie this up for a second. So we've got our terminators. We've got our cable. A is going to send it to C. But every computer connected will have an opportunity to read that packet, even though it's going to C. At the same time, file server is sending it to D, but it's going to go to every single computer on that network as well. That's going to create a collision. Only one computer at a time can send data on a bus. So what would happen if that is a collision? Well, these are the steps. Both compay and server will stop their transmission. It'd be like, halt, do not do anything else. Each use random wait time. They get to check the status of the bus network. So what I mean by that, well, Comp A will be like, yo, is anyone using it? Everyone's like, no, we're good. So we'll send it. Finally, attempt to retransmit. This, folks, is how it handles a collision. So it uses this random wait time. This could be two milliseconds, this could be 10 milliseconds. So this next question, let me just... Adding a switch to the local area network changes its topology. Explain how the user switch removes a collision. Well, if we were to put a switch and then we have comp A, comp B, comp C, comp D, and file server. This is creating a star network. So, whoo, I'm running out of space. One minute. We've got a star topology. That is what we've created. You actually get a mark for just saying that. Now, how does the switch work? Well, a switch has a number of ports. That's another mark. These ports allow these computers to connect to them. So each computer uses a dedicated cable, so it's their own cable, to connect to the port, which connects to the switch. So, star topology, ports, dedicated cable. What happens next? A switch provides a direct path. So if I was wanting to send a packet to, from C, a. What would happen is it'll make a direct path for me. It'll go through here to the ports. It'll then follow this path to compute A. No one else can intercept it. No one else could collide with it. There's no longer collisions. So by this dedicated path, this direct path, I'm going to use direct path, no more collisions. And now, all devices have dedicated links or paths. And there are your marks. You've created a star, 
switch, switch, port, dedicated cable, direct um, transmission path from device to device, no more collisions, and every device connected has their own dedicated cable. So there you go, happy days. Pause the video, give us a question and get yourself first. Okay, describe one benefit of a using a wireless network compared to using a wired network. Well, here's the thing. <laughs> Picture a school with a thousand computers, or let's say a hundred, let's say thirty computers in a classroom. Not laptops, desktop computers, and these are connected via wires. Each wire or each connection costs money. The wire itself costs money. It costs money to install if we want to get another computer put on. We're going to make, need or shall I say, another connection. Guess what? That's going to cost us money. So the benefit of using wireless is less money spent due to cost of setting up a network being cheaper. As less wires needed. So that's one benefit, the cost. Let's have a look at another benefit. Let's take this into account. These computers are fixed down using wire cables. Then picture a school where people have devices, let's say like a iPad, and it's connected through Wi-Fi. It means that we can actually take these iPads to different classrooms, so not fixed in one position or put them in different uh, desks, etc. So we can change the classroom around if it's in a school. So another advantage is going to be devices are more mobile as they can be positioned anywhere but what's key is within range so you can't in our school for example go to uh, Burger King down the road and hope to connect to the school Wi-Fi far too far away from the range so that is two benefits cost of setup due to not needing as many wires But the third one is going to be easier to set up. Think about it. Easier to set up because you're not using cables. So there's no need to physically connect devices. Which then leads to it, the original point of it being cheaper. Cheaper to install, cheaper to set up, blah, 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 blah. So these are three different things. We can talk about the cost. We can talk about portability or mobility that we can use it anywhere within range. And finally, we can talk about, um, I said, the complexity of setting it up. So these are all benefits of using a wireless network. But what are the negatives? Well, number one, if I've got computer A in a building and computer B in a building, guess what computer C could do? It could eavesdrop. It could be doing a man in the middle attack. This person sending data packets to B, C can intercept, happy days, read it. Ooh, very nice. So, one negative. Transmissions may secure due to data inception or data packets being intercepted. Mm. 
going to put man in middle. Man in middle attack. So that is one negative. But there are more negatives, believe it or not. I need to picture a bandwidth like a road, like a highway, where you can have lot. These are cars, by the way, these are dots. This is like a highway in America. USA, USA. You've got loads of cars traveling up and down this highway. Cool. This would be like a wired bandwidth. It can cope with more cars driving up and down all at the same time. However, let's imagine a highway which looks like this. You can have a few cars on it, driving up and down at the same time, but it's not as many as this version, version A, but wired. So wireless, which is my road B, has limited bandwidth. So this is number two. If you have more devices connected, it becomes slow. If you've already got like a couple of devices connected, this is fine. We can deal with this. But if you've got loads, it's going to create traffic. It's not going to be able to deal with it. Let's have a look at another negative. I'm going to give you a really simple one here. This is a kitchen. This is a router. The router is giving off signals. Wire signals. This is a microwave in my kitchen. It's also giving off signals. Because I'm cooking some baked beans. Guess what? There's interference between different signals. So my data gets corrupted. So the third drawback, higher chance of, we call this noise or interference from other signals. This can lead to corrupted data. Okay, let's have another issue. This is building A. This is building B. I want to access a router which is in building A. I'm on my computer and it's got a cable. The cable's plugged in, travels all the way to building A and the range is fine. I can use it still. However, if I was doing this wirelessly, the range may only be covering this area. So with a wireless network, the range is not as high. So that means we need to buy repeaters. Repeaters will boost the signal to make the signal bigger or wider. So that's another negative. So just to make that clear. So number four, you can mention it's a limited range more need for repeaters. We call this attenuation, where basically the signal, attenuation, degrades the further it gets. So the further you are away from like the router, the poorer the signal. And the final negative, and I'm not gonna draw this one, it's going to be higher latency. What do we mean by latency? So let's imagine that you're playing like an online shooting game. 
it's first person, so that means that you see it through the eyes. And actually, it's through third person, makes no difference. So, third person game, we're controlling a character, they've got a gun, etc. You see an opponent on your screen, and you shoot them. However, because of high latency, there's a delay. Whilst you may have pressed a button to shoot them, let's say like a mouse button, on their end, they're a little bit ahead. So, by the time you register and you press the mouse button and it sends it to a server saying, hey, he's just fired the, um, the gun, the opponent would have, let's say, pressed an A key to move upwards, would have sent it to the server. Let's imagine that their latency is low. That basically means that the player who is shooting moves and the bullet arrives as a, like a lag. And it's frustrating because you might have thought it was a perfect headshot, but in fact, the latency has cost you. So high latency means slower transmission speeds. So when I play my online games, because I'm a serial gamer, I use an ethernet cable. Pause the video, give all of these questions a go first yourself. Okay, so the first question is, turn this local area network into a star topology. The main aspect of a star or the central focus point in this is the switch. Normally we re represent a star like this. In this situation, it's slightly different. So how can we replicate this? Well, first things first, we've got the server connected to the switch. But we also need computer A connected to the switch. We need computer B connected to the switch. We also need computer C connected to the switch. So it's gonna look something like this. And I'm gonna draw arrows on it. So you can see it's a two-way relationship. Now we go see whether or not these statements are true or false. The server can send packets to computer B and computer C at the same time. True, buses can't, stars can. The network software in each computer needs to include collision detection and avoidance. No, we don't need that anymore. We don't need that anymore because a star network contains a switch which manages any types of collision. Packets aren't going to get get collided. Computer B can read a packet sent from service computer C false. It's sent directly on its own dedicated channel. Computer A can send a packet to computer B at the same time as a service sending a packet to computer C. Correct, there's no more collisions, so happy days. I'm saying happy days a lot, but whatever. The local area network in part A will be connected to the internet. A router will be attached um, to one of the devices on the local area network. Um, state the device used, so which device do I need to connect it to? Well, I can connect it to either the server or the switch. I'm gonna do it to the server. Sorry, to switch even. So I'm gonna put switch. And I'm gonna save that by my answer, internet traffic now does not overload server. So if you connect it to the server, which is possible, instead of the switch, we're basically, every time we have data sent in, it'll go from the router, um, then to the server. The problem with that is everyone wants to connect to the internet has to go through the server in the first place. This will basically put a lot of stress on the server and we use the server for other things like requesting files. If everyone's requesting things from the server, including internet, it could crash the server. DDoS it. Even though servers can act as a firewall, software firewall, so if we did have a server, we can say, well, if we connect our router to our server, um, we can have now a firewall, which is fine, but we don't want to stress out the server. So sending it to the switch, the switch doesn't need to bother the server, so we can just connect to the computers with ease. Why is a router required? Well, what's the role of a router or router, depending on where you're from? It acts as a gateway between internal 
that's our local area network and I just put internet mm -hmm. internal and external networks the router itself can act as a firewall if you're not using the server router acts as firewall router connects the LAN internal and external networks. We said this already. I'll put external using different protocols. So they use different protocols, local area network and wide area network or internet. And the router can translate all of that. But what other things can a router do? Router for its packets. To different networks. Such as the internet. So I can send something from this computer to a computer in USA. It forwards the packets to the router, it goes to another router, to another router, to another router, to where I need it to go. So it forwards the packets on. Routers have a public IP address. Allowing external computers from external networks to contact us so it knows where we live. Routers also hold all our local addresses, private IP addresses. So in our school, we've got our public IP address where Netflix will send movies to. And then it will use like a routing table to find the IP address of the computer who wants to watch a movie. So it'll be me in my classroom, D1. It'll use my private IP address, it'll find me because it's got that list and I can watch the movie. And finally, it can take these local addresses and translate them to actual IP addresses. So that's what the router does. So it does seven things. It allows a gateway between internal and external networks. It acts as a firewall, a software firewall. It connects local area network to wide area networks or internal to external, and it converts for different protocols or translates for different protocols. It forwards packets to different networks. It has my public IP address, so external people can contact me. Um, it also holds local addresses. It also translates these local addresses into IP addresses. So there's many jobs a router can do. And it's neat. After the router has been connected, computer A sends packets to an internet web server, let's say in Netflix in USA. Explain how the packets are transmitted from the router to the web server. Easy. One, each packet has um, the destination IP address of where it's going to go. The router examines it. Oh, you need to go to America. I'll help you get there. The router, or the routers, so this router will pass it on to another router, which will pass it on to another router, and they'll do this using a routing table. This routing table will allow them to make a decision on which path to take to get us to the USA. The whole point of routers is to forward packets, we talked about this in the last question, to destination. We know that these packets when they're on route can take different routes based upon traffic, efficiency, whatever it may be. So we take different routes. We know that when we get to the web server, so Netflix will receive quite a few packets from me. These packets will be out of order. This is packet one, this is my second packet, this is my third. So the server will reassemble the packets and put them into order. And there we go. That is the process of sending packets from computer A 
to an internet web server. It goes, each packet has a destination IP address. It then goes to the local router. The router will use a routing table to pass it on to other routers. It'll take different routes based upon uh, efficiency, traffic, etc. Um, packets, when they do arrive, they may arrive out of order, so it'll be reassembled back into order at the web server's end. And there you go. So cloud storage, there's my little cloud. This is my phone. What are the benefits of storing data using cloud computing and give two drawbacks of using cloud computing? Pause the video, give it a go yourself first. Well, with cloud computing, here's one benefit. To start off with, you normally get free storage. It's normally free to begin with. So that's a great entice and yeah, a great benefit. Normally they do, okay, have 20 gigs, 100 gigs for free, whatever it's gonna be. And then we'll charge you later. Second thing, no need for high capacity storage. So I'm working on developing a video game at the moment. I'm doing it on my home PC, but my home PC's got limited storage. I've got like one terabyte only. So what I'm doing is I'm putting the game files on my Google Cloud. That means my one terabyte of storage isn't being taken up by the game I'm developing. So I don't need for separate storage, which is separate, <coughs> which is physical. Let me just make this bigger. Oh, wrong one. And separate. Okay, what's another advantage? Well, <laughs> I can access it from any device. I can access it from my phone, as I said, my one terabyte PC, my school laptop. So I can access from any device. As long as that device, and this is key, has internet access. Can't just say any device, you need to mention it has to have internet access. Uh oh, my PC dies. I need to buy a new one. I've lost a game I'm developing. Uh uh, it's on my cloud storage. Uh oh, it's got a virus. I uploaded a virus to my cloud storage. Uh oh, my game gets corrupt. It's okay, Google offer a backup service. So they go back in time, they find the game that I'm making before the virus and they restore it. So it has backup services for data. Some companies offer amazing security, maybe better, then I've got my own PC. I've decided to hire someone from Japan to do my artwork. Guess what? I can share files easily because they can also connect to my um, cloud storage. So data can be shared. And finally, uh oh, I'm running out of cloud storage in terms of space. Okay, I'll pay to get more. Now my cloud storage is huge. I've paid not that much money, but I haven't had to do it myself. So easily increased my storage capacity if I needed it. So all of these are the advantages. Free for small quantity, no separate um, storage devices needed, uh, access data from any computer with internet access, built-in backup services, security could be better than what I've got already, can easily increase my capacity, although I might have to pay for it, and data can be shared easily 
way more easier than if I wanted to share a game which is on my PC and on my PC only I would have to like somehow email the game over yeah good luck I'll have to compress it it'll take ages <laughs> and then you've got the negatives the negatives seem to be the flips of the positive so for example you need internet access to connect to cloud security may not be strong <laughs> I said it could be strong but it may not be strong and the problem is you have no control over that another issue <laughs> there, may no, <laughs> there may not be a backup service. Again, you've got no control. Let's go up because I'm hitting our space down. Another. And this is true. It could have high or long upload, download. can't spell download properly, times. So it may take a long time to upload something. So when I put my game onto my Google Cloud, it could take about 20 minutes, half an hour. It could be more expensive long term. So let's imagine that I've got my 80 gigs of storage in my Google Cloud. I've used it all up. I then make it a hundred. I pay an extra five dollars a month. Over time, that five dollars each month will add up, and it could come to a higher price than buying an extra hundred gigs, or sorry, an extra twenty gigs, because it's eighty to hundred myself. That might only cost me fifty dollars, whereas my cloud storage is costing me per year around sixty-five. Actually, it's 50 per month, so way more than that. You get a gist. I can't even do the calculation. 50 times a year, 650, I think. So I may as well just buy it instead of, as in, buy a new hard drive or extend my hard drive rather than use cloud storage. Cheaper short term, more expensive long term. There may be a limit in storage. So it might be that Google say, we only offer up to 120 gigs. Then what? What am I gonna do then? I'm gonna to have to make a new account. That's gonna be a pain in the backside. So I start again. So I have two accounts going. There could be compatibility issues. What I mean by that is this. There'll be certain apps out there and programs which save files in certain ways. I then upload it to the cloud. But the cloud saves it in a different way because it won't be able to save it in a way which this app saves it as. So when I try and download it again, it doesn't work. So all of these are different problems. And finally, what happens if Google have issues themselves? So issues with a company offering a service, like downtime. What happens if Google service go down? I can't get access to any of my work. So you notice a lot of the negatives are the positives with some differences in certain places. So what is bit streaming? What is that meant by that term? Well, so if I just do a little channel here and we have our bits, mm -mm -mm, which have been sent. These are a sequence of bits. They've been sent. They've been sent over 
a communication path. The internet. This is like a highway. It's rapid. They're driving at 1,000 miles an hour. So it's high speed data transfer. But in order for this to work, you need to have fast broadband. Otherwise, you don't get access to this fast bandwidth. Because it's going to be fast, we need to have in place some buffering, which I'll talk about in a bit. Buffering leading to bits arriving in same order as sent. So we send it as 0101010101. And they arrive as 0101010. So we've got this sequence of bits which are sent down the communication path, it's high speed, which means that you need to have fast broadband to cope with this high speed. There needs to be buffering because of the high speed, and eventually the bits will arrive in the same order as how they're sent. That is bit streaming. So the second question is all about streaming a movie from a website to a tablet computer. So we've got our server here, it's a Netflix. We've got our uh, phone here. And we've got our like highway. What will happen is when we're streaming, before the movie begins, the streaming service, as in Netflix, won't play the movie straight away, so it won't play. You'll get a little bit of a loading. So it'll load. And what will happen is it will download a small part of the film into what we know as our buffer. Just a small part. By preloading this into our buffer, and we hit then play, what will happen is our phone will start playing the movie from our buffer, but at the same time, the data is filling up the buffer with more parts of the movie. This allows a smooth connection to take place. But if we don't have good broadband, and it's slow, what could happen is we have nothing in our buffer, we're waiting, the movie's playing, and it'll start to lag, and it'll go back to us loading again. And we call that a buffer underrun. So how does that relate to this question? Well, bit streaming means no need to wait for a whole movie to be downloaded. Instead, it preloads the data in the buffer. Because of all of this, and because we don't need to wait, because it's being streamed, we don't need to, to store large movie on our secondary storage. No need to do that. Because we're just streaming it from the server. Because of bit streaming. But also it allows us to play back whenever we want. On demand. That means that we can just rewatch it whenever we want. Which is different to like um, TV, etc. Well, old school TV. And finally, no need for specialist software. So no need for it. 
Netflix just needs a browser. Nothing fancy. So, no need to wait for the file to be downloaded because it's going to be put into our buffer. No need to store large files on our storage. Allows on-demand playback so we can play it whenever we want and we don't need to have specialist software. These are all benefits of bit streaming. So what problems do we have with bit streaming? Well, there's a few. This is a server. This is our phone. There's a virus. Uh oh, virus downloaded from server. That is a problem with bit streaming. It can happen. It happens on dodgy websites like one, two, three movies, or go, go anime, or whatever websites you go on. Another is going to be what happens if your internet goes down? Loss of internet. means no more watching so no ability to watch stream content that's a massive issue another issue slow internet if you've got slow internet that is going to cause an issue with the um, streaming because the buffer will be empty when the buffer is empty and it hangs we've got issues and remember that's called a buffer underrun and another issue might be that your buffer may be really small in the first place if your buffer is small you can't store that much data you can't store that much data it's going to lag why would your buffer be pretty bad? So why would you have inadequate buffer? So I'm going to put inadequate buffer capacity. Why would that be the case? Well, you might have an old computer, old computers, limited buffer. This is what happens, technology increases. Um, if your computer's technology is old, it might fill up the buffer really, really quickly. And in that situation, create a buffer overflow. That's where basically it's it can't hold anything anymore, it's too much. And that can also create a situation where videos pause. So videos could pause whilst you're streaming if you've got a buffer overflow because the capacity isn't high enough or if um, your internet's too slow, where you've got what we discussed before, the buffer not filling up. So this is quite an old concept really where you've got on-demand versus real-time. On-demand is basically like watching Netflix, old-school Netflix. So you can select a movie whenever you want and you can watch it, resume it, pause. Real-time is like a sports event where it's in a stadium and it's being filmed live by cameras all over. So with on-demand the way it works, a source material, so for example, a video, digital video, or it could be old school video like analog. They're converted for bit streaming. So they're converted to bits. So that they're in a format to be transmitted. Or should we say broadcast on the net, over the internet. And we call that encoding. What happens is once these videos are encoded, they're put onto a server. So Netflix has like a dedicated server just for video streaming. So let's imagine that Netflix could have put on like a 1990s movie. Let's say Robocop. What a movie. This would be in analog form. So it wouldn't be like a DVD. It would be like an old probably cassette tape. VHS. It'll then have to go in this situation from analog. Get converted into uh, bit streaming. 
is going to be formatted so that it could be transmitted over the internet and we call this process encoding so the movie then is put onto Netflix uh, Robocop onto the Netflix dedicated server then a link is put on to like a website or web page user clicks link and what happens is it downloads the encoded video and starts streaming. Users can then pause, rewind, we watch fast forward so basically we're describing bit streaming but in a little bit more detail we're talking about it going from a video source like digital video or analog it needs to be converted for streaming it needs to be formatted so that we can actually transmit it and broadcast it over netflix in this situation so all of this is called encoding so this is encoding the video we then put it onto a dedicated server we then put a link to the encoded video on Netflix, so a user clicks it, it downloads onto their computer, well, it starts downloading, which basically means we're gonna start streaming. It gives us the ability to pause, rewind, rewatch, or fast forward. This is different to real time. Real time, we have video cameras. These video cameras capture live footage. The cameras are connected to a computer. So that each camera is connected to a computer. We then have a video signal. This video signal has been encoded, kind of like we talked about with um, on demand. So it's turned into a format so that we can have a dedicated stream like watching the football live and this dedicated stream is from a dedicated stream server so like with Netflix there's a supercomputer server this server is where people like me on my phone I connect to so I can watch the football so the cameras are connected to the server you encode the footage so the server allows people to download using high speed internet or cable TV or so the server will send these live images. The live images is basically the footage to all users who request the streaming. And it sends it us as live video which cannot be paused which is different to on demand so this is different because we have video cameras which capture the footage which are connected to computer the computer will encode the footage um, it will send a video signal which is encoded to a digital server which is a streaming server which this dedicated server will allow me to make requests saying yo give me the football match it will use high speed internet or cable TV or DSL and it will send me the live images as live streaming or live video. So that's the difference between these on demand bit streaming versus real time bit streaming. Pause the video, give us a question and go yourself first. Okay, so I'm starting my own business. We're going to be selling um, chickens. Cool. And I've got a team of people who are going to help me out. But I haven't got much money, so I buy these really old computers. We want to carry out some heavy video editing to make a commercial. The problem is these computers aren't powerful enough to do that. So we spend money on a server. We install the video editing software on the server. We uh, make sure that the server's got some really good CPU and our computers connect to the server. 
when we make our movie and we finished, I'm going to hit... Well, let's say I'm editing it actually at the moment. And I hit play just to view it. Normally, it'll put a lot of stress on my computer. But because we're using what's called a thin client environment, all the stress is going to be done on the server. It's going to be carrying out all the processing. It's a very powerful CPU which I'm using on the server, whilst this is an old computer, it just won't be able to cope. So my computer basically turns into like a, a TV screen. I watch it happen. So the computer is doing nothing. The screen is just displaying. The server is doing all the heavy work. All the apps I'm using are on the server. They don't live on my computer, but are on the server. That basically means that I can use a really bad computer and still perform really powerful operations. So what is meant by a thin client? Well, a thin client is where processing is carried out on a server. Applications are stored and executed on the server. Very simple. The next part is why would we use thin client over a thick client system? Well, here's the thing. Fit client has its own advantages. It means we don't have to rely upon the server. It means that we can upscale as much as we want. We don't have to rely on the CPU of the server. We don't have to rely on the software being on the server. We can edit it live without any um, internet connection or network connection. I can do it as standalone. But the advantages of thin clients, it's going to be cheaper to purchase clients. It's important that you give an explanation of why it's cheaper. Cheaper to purchase clients. It's less configuration slash setup of clients because I don't need to do anything. So I can call up a company, so let's call it um, GoDaddy, and they can set up the server for me. They can install everything. They can do everything on my behalf. They can set all the software on. They can make sure the CPU is great. They can make sure that the graphics card is up to date. I don't need to do anything. So that's configuration. Because of that, less setup of software. slash update software. Well, think about it. If I was using Fit Client, I'd have video editor on this computer, on this computer, on this computer. If I want to make an update, I'd have to update this computer, then this computer, then this computer. By using a Fit Client environment, I just update the video editing software on the server, and that's all I need to do. That way, these computers connect, and remember, they just turn into monitors. They didn't do any of the processing. If I want to install new software, let's say um, I want to put on Unity, which is like a game engine, because I'm going to make a chicken game. I don't need to put it on every computer installed. I just install it on the server and the clients just run it. So it's less setup slash installation and no need to update. You could also say that these um, workstations are going to take up less power, less electricity, because they're not actually doing any of the processing. It's the server which is doing it in a different building, a different country. So less electricity, less power. You could also say that it's impossible to install I'm going to put rogue or unauthorized software on client. I'll explain that in a second. So if we were using fit clients, you would install your own software. So this person here would be able to put on like maybe their own games. They could, let's say, put a little bit of Valorant on the computer without any permission. It's easy to do, but because we're using ThinClient and everything's done on the server, you're not going to be able to install onto the server Valorant without everyone else noticing. Licensing 
it's going to be cheaper. Why? Well, that's really simple. You buy the software once for the server and it could be used by many different people. Whereas if we had the video ads on this, on this, on this, we'd have to buy three different licenses. So it's kind of cheating. And finally, because these workstations are not doing much work, less maintenance. They won't break down as much. Even though they might be old or not high spec, because they're not doing much, less likely to break down. So these are a lot of advantages of thin client over thick client.